If you're thinking about quitting your job to change careers, there are a few things about it that no one ever really talks about. The focus tends to be on practical advice like saving money or not burning bridges when you leave. And yes, you should think about those things, but there's also this scarier psychological toll on your mental health that no one talks about. This is my story about escaping my career in Hollywood. I know there are many people out there silently suffering through the exact same heartbreak and anxieties that I did. Hopefully, as I share my story while fixing up my little cabin in the woods, it'll help you feel less lonely wherever you are in life. Maybe even comforted to know that there is someone out there that you can relate to and there's light at the end of the tunnel. To begin, I first need to explain what a narcissist is. You might think you know what they are, but let me clear up some common misunderstandings about them. When you think of the quintessential narcissist, you imagine Patrick Bateman from American Psycho. Is that a gram? New card. What do you think? Oh, very nice. Look at that. Typically male, charming, egotistical, yet devoid of any real identity of their own. I thought that was all there was to it. It turns out there are people in your life you wouldn't even know are narcissists. Namely, the covert narcissist, typically female, withdrawn, and shy. They come across as lost potential. Loved ones want to help them, fix them, or at the very least, reassure them. But when you're around them, they seem to always be angry about how they're not getting what they deserve, especially when others seem to be succeeding. They live to experience schadenfreude, the act of relishing in others' misfortune. They take every opportunity to laugh at you or anyone else they feel like targeting. There's a funny thing about the covert narcissist. She can turn into the classic narcissist when they do get the validation that they need to exist. The shy, jealous, petty person becomes more boastful and egotistical, but also cruel in the way they step on others to get validation because it's not like their jealousy, insecurity, and pettiness went away overnight. Think Livia from The Sopranos. Oh. Vice versa, the Patrick Batemans can turn into Olivia if they don't get enough validation in their life. They go from egotistical, confident people to angry and withdrawn, wondering why people aren't noticing their unique and special qualities anymore. Then there's the community narcissists. These narcissists are typically teachers, pastors, charity organizers, and the like. They tend to do good things in the name of validation, but not because they actually care about the cause. They just like the praise and adoration that comes with the good deed. They have a tendency to be outwardly charming to the people who think they're doing good, but to the people in their personal lives, they are the complete opposite. In fact, they might even look down on the very people they're helping. The constant Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde switch exhausts you, but somehow you want to believe that there's good in them, because how could they be bad when they do such good things in their day-to-day -day life? When I learn about these types of narcissists, I realize I know these people. I've known them intimately for a very long time. These personality traits describe almost everyone I've met in Hollywood. From the seemingly shy artists who step on others to climb the ladder, to the do-gooder teachers who help you but are actually just selling the scam that's the Hollywood dream. In fact, these traits describe the Hollywood industry itself. I learned about the different ways narcissists manipulate you in order to get the oh-so-sweet nectar of validation they need to feel secure. When you make them jealous by simply existing, they send flying monkeys, people in your life they've poisoned and turned against you, to attack you and make themselves feel superior. When you decide to leave the relationship, they hoover, meaning the different ways they suck you back into the toxic relationship. Love bombing, smear campaigns, spreading lies, or pretending to be a victim, all in the name of getting validation. In order for them to feel less insecure for a tiny moment, they need to do everything in their power to put you down. For the first time, I made sense of what happened to me as I entered and then left Hollywood. This ripped open old wounds that I thought I did a good job of closing up and scabbing over. From the ridiculous smear campaigns to thinking about the people I can no longer call friends, I realized I fell into every hoovering trap they laid to keep me entangled in their web. But I wasn't going to take part in this game anymore. I decided to leave, to quit my job. But it's not so easy to untangle yourself from the narcissist web. Since my personal narcissist wasn't getting their daily dose of validation anymore, they stopped seeing me as an ally. Instead, 
I became a tumor, a sore throat, a problem to be dealt with. This is what I call the Hollywood Narcissist Factory. First, they take away your identity and sell you a fake one that you can't possibly live up to. For me, it was, one day you'll be a renowned and successful artist in Hollywood. Only if you kiss the ring, study hard, and fall in line, that is. Step two, they force you to validate them constantly so you live in their fake version of reality. For me, it was, isn't Hollywood great? Isn't this movie great? Then they'll engage in step three, gaslighting and other manipulation techniques to make you confused. You think, well, that movie actually isn't that great, but people I know worked on it. Everyone is agreeing, except me, so I must be the crazy one. If I say otherwise, they're kind of weird about it, so let me try my best to compliment them. And just like that, you throw away your own independent thought. You just want to fit in after all. Finally, in step four, when you come back into the toxic cycle, they love bomb you. They shower you with compliments and validation. They imply things like, you have such great taste. You'd make a great art director. Suddenly, everyone loves you again. It feels good to be seen and appreciated. They even promise you future promotions, successfully turning you into a narcissist too. You've lost sight of what is real and worst of all, your own thoughts and identity. Never mind that, they're ostracizing you again. Time to say what you have to say so they love you again. Or, if you're like me, you realize something is very wrong here. As good as you feel, you also feel bad. In fact, you feel bad most of the time. When I quit, it felt great at first. As good as you think it would feel. I felt like I was taking control of my life. I removed myself from a situation that I knew wasn't good for me. I broke myself out of the matrix. But after a while, that faded and I felt like I was still trapped in that narcissistic cycle of abuse. I couldn't understand why, even though I left, I still felt like I was being controlled by the narcissist. I thought maybe if I shouted loud enough, they'd hear me. There's still hope that Hollywood could be better to their students and employees. If only I could do something. Maybe it can actually live up to the Hollywood dream if they change a few things here and there. Looking back, it's clear how crazy this all sounds. But at the moment, I desperately wanted to help others who were still trapped in the Matrix. Even though they hated me, I'm that tumor after all. I couldn't accept that they wanted to be there. They chose the blue pill. Yet another part of me felt abandoned. I felt so incredibly hurt by the people I thought were my friends. It was painful to live with people much more influential than I spreading lies about me. I couldn't understand how I could give so much and dedicate my entire life to an industry and in return threw me to the side in two seconds when I decided to have a little autonomy. I knew it was dangerous to have an opinion different from that of the group, but don't I deserve that much as a human being? The reaction to my voice voicing a different opinion was too extreme a punishment for what it was. In fact, why should I be punished at all? This thought filled me with so much rage, I just wanted to give them a little taste of what it felt like. If it's my opinion they're so scared of, then I'll use it like ammunition pointed directly at them. I wanted to be just as cruel to them as they were to me. So my mind went, a washing machine going around in circles, slowly driving myself insane. One day, I wanted to exact revenge. The next, I wanted to fix the unfixable. It was impossible for me to just let go and move on because there was one thing I couldn't admit to myself. It was comforting, like going back to an ex. If I really let go and accept that Hollywood is never going to change, I'd have to find a new love. One to replace the deep passion that I gave it for over a decade. Plus, there's no guarantee that I'll find something I love as much. What if there will be nothing after this? I'd have no purpose, I'd just be an empty void. Except I'd be worse than nothing because my self-esteem was torn into little bits and pieces after so many years of other people telling me, you'll be great, maybe, one day. I wondered if everything the narcissist said about me was true. People loved saying things like, I have X number of years of experience. It's my opinion that matters, not hers. She's a nobody. I really thought, maybe they're right. Who am I to have the audacity to have opinions? That's the residual effects of the narcissist when you leave them. That's exactly what they want, to make you insecure, to make you feel like you don't deserve the most basic of human rights, so that even when they're gone, they still have control over you. But I was sick and tired of arguing. I deserve better, I deserve to be happy, and I want my own thoughts back. So even though it was painful, I let go of the parts of myself that clung onto my love for Hollywood. 
I stopped trying to fix it and accepted that they will never change for the better. I stopped wanting revenge and forgave the cruel things done to me. I fell into what I was most scared of, the deep black void of purposelessness and loneliness. Except that's not at all what I fell into. I found a little glowing spark hiding away in the darkness. This was a me who existed before Hollywood. A person I desperately wanted to find again. A kind, happy, confident person who loved art because it was beautiful. She showed me things about myself that I'd forgotten, like how I always wanted to travel across the country. I wanted to live in a quiet place in the mountains. In a way, it felt like I was 10 years old again, but now a little older in a more capable body. Before I knew it, I went days without ruminating on who hates me and who I hate. My self-confidence started coming back. My own thoughts weren't attacking me and making me feel small anymore. And it revealed how much space there really was in my mind. Space to let new people and experiences in. Things that actually made me feel good. Sometimes, when we leave a toxic situation, we continue to act as if we're still living in it. Depending on how long you stayed, you are conditioned to put yourself down. You might not even realize how low your self-confidence actually is, because the things you tell yourself seem normal. Things like, you're not good enough, you'll never be good enough, and because of that, you need to always work hard and suffer. In order to free yourself from their control, you have to replace their hypercritical thoughts with your own true thoughts. Thoughts that genuinely care about your well-being. The kind of thoughts that tell you you're smart, you're capable, you have value, and you deserve to be happy. Check out these videos next for more videos like this, and don't forget to remember to be kind to yourself today.